How we make decisions about genetically engineered organisms, or GEOs, will become increasingly important for future and current generations like yours. GEOs are becoming more common in our food, agricultural, and even environmental systems. For example, over 95% of major food and feed crops in the U.S., corn, soybean, and cotton, are genetically engineered with pesticidal proteins, or ones that confer tolerance to herbicides. The entry of GEOs, more commonly known as GMOs, into the food supply has caused public controversy since their introduction in the mid-1990s and over their 25-year history. Consumer backlash has been significant and currently over 45% of U.S. consumers are choosing to avoid GM foods. Yet biotechnology developers argue that GEO crops are needed to improve and secure the food supply under conditions of climate change and environmental degradation and also that they can provide significant benefits to human health and nutrition. The history of GM crops is mixed. Although there have been reductions of chemical pesticide use in some regions from the use of GM crops, unfortunately, the first generation of GM foods has largely benefited large seed and biotechnology companies and some farmers that produce commodity crops. Furthermore, increases in the use of herbicide Roundup have resulted in resistant weeds causing recontrol problems in agriculture and ecosystems. The first generation of GM crops is a complicated medley of benefits, consumer mistrust, policy controversies, and risks. And now, genetically engineered animals like faster growing salmon, pigs with reduced allergenicity potential, and thermotolerant cattle have been approved for food use and are reaching the marketplace. Consumers are even less likely to accept GE animal-based foods, as several social science surveys have shown. Some of these GE animals are being used not only for food, but also medicine. The GE pig with lower allergenicity that I just mentioned was also used for a heart organ transplant. You might have heard recently about the first human heart transplant from that genetically engineered pig in the news. Although the surgery was initially successful, the patient died two months later. Genetically engineered insects are also being released into open ecosystems. Most are designed to control their own populations. GE insects have been released in the United States to control agricultural pests like the diamondback moth and to control human disease vectors like mosquito species that carry dengue and Zika virus. These releases have been very controversial in local communities with residents and environmental groups opposing their release. You will co-reside with genetically engineered organisms and ecosystems, not only in agriculture and food systems, but also open ecosystems. You may come in contact with them in the countryside and in the city. In words from an essay by Adam Rutherford, the next stage of biology is actually a human technology. And good science fiction is always a reflection of current events. How do you want the natural world to look in the future? Do you think that you should have a say in that future with genetic engineering? My research and policy engagement work for the past 25 years has centered around the wicked problem of how we can better govern emerging technologies like GE. I've come to the conclusion that better governance means better ways to engage diverse publics in having a voice for making decisions about what GEOs they want to see in the future food supplies and ecosystems. A wicked problem that my work has addressed is how can we engage people in governance of GEOs, steering innovation towards applications that truly benefit society, while making sure that they are responsibly overseen and respecting diverse public values? One sub-problem of governance that I've written extensively about is that our regulatory, oversight, and policy systems have largely been closed off to public voices, and even to those of outside independent experts. Our decision-making about GEOs seldom includes independent ecologists and risk assessors, social scientists, ethicists, diverse publics, and stakeholders. Articles I've written with some colleagues are on this slide if you are interested in reading more on the topic. Currently, two groups have power in decision-making about which GEOs should be approved for release. Biotech developers, who self-assess the safety of their products in regulatory submission packets, and then government regulatory experts that review these assessments and make a decision based on the limited legal authorities that they have. The public and outside experts have very limited, if any, opportunities to provide input. Furthermore, it is really difficult to find out what GE products are in the marketplace. 
Information on them is either buried across several government websites or not available at all due to confidential business information or because the products are exempt from regulatory approval. In The Social Scientist, several scholars like myself have pointed out that the system is not inclusive or transparent and that this is likely feeding into the distrust of GEOs among consumers and other stakeholder groups. In addition to being largely closed to the public, our regulatory system and therefore our decisions about GEOs are based almost exclusively on a small set of risks given limited legal authorities. The main risks that we assess for are whether crops are toxic to animals or humans or harmful to U.S. agriculture. The regulatory system doesn't really take into account broader ecosystem impacts like climate change impacts or land, water, or other resource impacts or indirect risks and benefits. And there are even more issues to consider with GEOs than just toxicological safety. Social, cultural, and ethical aspects of GEOs are very important, but not considered in decisions about whether a GEO is released or not. Do you think these issues should be considered in making a decision about GEOs? Should a wider array of publics and stakeholders be included in decision making? One argument I've made for being more inclusive in oversight of GE is that even safety itself cannot strictly be based on scientific information. Scientific information should of course be a cornerstone of assessing risk. That is the probability of harm. But deciding what risk to consider in decision making, where the cutoff of what is safe should be, and how precautious we should be are value judgments that go beyond science. Take, for example, a dose-response curve for a chemical or a GM food. We mostly assess the safety of GM food by feeding large amounts of an engineered substance to lab animals, like mice, in short periods of time. So our data are usually up here. In reality, for human consumption of GM foods, we are more interested in long-term consumption over the lifetime of lower levels of the GM substance. In other words, we are interested in what happens down here. However, this is nearly impossible to test for prior to GM foods entering the market. So we make assumptions of what the dose response curve looks like at these low levels of a potential hazard. In other words, there is uncertainty. Furthermore, even if we could know that curve perfectly, what level of a GM food is safe and should be approved during regulation? We have to have a cutoff for making a yes or no decision. This cutoff will depend on the core societal values of who is looking at the data. Are they more risk adverse or risk tolerant? Do they get benefits from eating the food so that they are more willing to accept a low level of risk or unknown risks? These are what we call the normative dimensions of decision making that are based on personal or societal values. Therefore, safety is not strictly a scientific concept and decisions about whether to release GMOs cannot be made only on scientific data. This idea is encapsulated by a quote by Albert Einstein, science can only ascertain what is, but not what should be, and outside of its domain, value judgments of all kinds remain necessary. So then, whose values should count in decision-making about GEOs? Should those of biotech developers and government regulators be the only ones? The paradigm of responsible research and innovation, also known as RRI, has emerged in the social science literature as a framework for ensuring that innovation is more aligned with societal values, addresses societal needs, and is open to diverse publics and stakeholders. RRI goes well beyond what we currently do and is based on four key principles. Reflexivity involves researchers and stakeholders considering their underlying motivations with respect to innovation, their knowledge limits and their assumptions, and alternative ways to consider problems beyond technological solutions. Anticipation encourages the consideration of potential downstream consequences of innovation far upstream of any technological product entering the market or an ecosystem. Inclusion engages public stakeholders and outside experts in anticipation and reflection, making sure that the hopes and concerns of publics are heard and considered. And finally, responsivity requires that innovation incorporates the results of inclusion, anticipation, and reflexivity into technological design 
technology developers should be willing to change direction and incorporate public concerns into their innovation processes. RI is a great paradigm in theory to make innovation in GE more publicly aligned, responsible, and sustainable. However, in practice, it is likely to be very difficult and has yet to be widely incorporated into U.S. innovation programs. So we had a National Science Foundation grant to study the attitudes of biotechnology stakeholders towards implementing the principles and practices of responsible research and innovation. We did this through quantitative surveys and qualitative focus groups, something we call in social sciences mixed methods. We interviewed and surveyed stakeholders from industry, government, academe, and nonprofit sectors. First, we found that attitudes towards RRI among innovators are based on the deep core values that people hold. Innovators with more hierarchical, that is top-down, and individualistic worldviews tend to believe that RRI is not necessary and that it will only delay innovation, which to them is undesirable. They'd rather leave GE decisions to a few experts or marketplace trends. On the other hand, people with more egalitarian worldviews had more favorable attitudes towards RRI. Second, we found that people from biotechnology industry affiliated sectors have more negative attitudes towards RRI. Yet these are the stakeholders typically with the most power to bring biotechnologies in the market. Third, we found that RRI was seen as a barrier to biotechnology innovation by biotechnologists in industry and academe. There was fear among biotechnology innovators that it would delay important work from occurring, reduce their competitiveness for funding, and stall their careers. So this brings me to another wicked problem. How can we overcome these real or perceived barriers to RRI? RRI or models like it seem important for more robust, equitable, and ethical decision-making about the kind of futures we want with genetic engineering. With these results in mind, my research team is currently working on what incentives will be needed to embed RRI in national funding and innovation programs for genetic engineering. So stay tuned for the results of that work, some of which has just been submitted for publication. So we've been on a bit of a journey in this talk, from the technical to the philosophical and the ethical, and finally to the practical policy needs. I'm so proud that we've built a center at NC State that is also this broad and interdisciplinary in examining our shared futures with genetic engineering. The Genetic Engineering and Society Center, or GS, convenes a community of students, faculty, staff, and external partners to address the wicked problems associated with the genetic engineering at the nexus of natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. And you can learn more about our center at our website and by attending our weekly GS Colloquium. Everybody is welcome. <laughs>